Intellectual Emmanuel Lieber, A Critique of Epistemology by Alfred Sonrethel. This is chapter 21 to 27. So chapter 21, from desocialized to re-socialized labor. In part one of this book, we have argued that intellectual labor divided from manual labor is ruled by a logic of appropriation. Socialism, however, demands a mode of thinking in accordance with a logic of production. This implies thinking by the direct producers themselves, and it would necessitate the unity of head and hand. It is our purpose now to investigate trends which dominate our present epoch with regard to this contrast. The reasoning involved is, of course, grounded in what has been set out in the preceding chapters. It is bound, however, to be a great deal more speculative since it is concerned with the present and future and serves, it is hoped, as a basis for further research by others. We have seen that the abstract intellectual work associated with the system of commodity production is an a priori socialized form of thinking, an antithesis to physical labor carried on independently and privately by individual producers. Since only products of mutually independent acts of labor performed in isolation can confront each other as commodities. The abstract intellect arose because labor lost its primitive collective form of working and became desocialized in such a way that the cohesion of society grew dependent on exchange instead of production. As the vehicle of the social synthesis or of societis, societis action or society, societization, as we might call it, <clears throat> exchange becomes monetary exchange activated by money being utilized as capital. In the initial epochs of commodity exchange, capital figured in the antediluvian form, as Marx called it, of monetary and merchant capital, only since then to seize upon the means of production and to operate them by wage labor. The logic of appropriation cannot be expected, expected to change into a logic of production so long as labor has not resumed its capacity of carrying the social synthesis. The antithesis between intellectual and physical labor will not vanish before the private and fragmented labor of commodity production has been turned into re-socialized labor. But as we know only too well, this in itself will not be enough. The re-socialized labor must become the societizing force which must bring about the unity of head and hand that will implement a classless society. Chapter 22, a third stage of the capitalist mode of production. In the end of, in the era of flow production, the socialization of labor has reached a stage higher than ever before, but of course in subordination to capital. The re-socialization of labor has been a major trend, if not indeed the main one in capitalist history. Marx distinguishes two stages of the process, the stage of manufacture followed by that of machinery and large-scale industry, machinofacture in short. We feel there may be good reasons for distinguishing a third stage, as Marx says. In manufacture, the transformation of the mode of production takes labor power as its starting point. In large-scale industry, on the other hand, the instruments of labor are the starting point. In monopoly capitalism and its flows, methods of production, I would continue, it is labor itself that forms the starting point. The ground for distinguishing this third stage lies in major structural changes in the labor process, occurring in pursuit of intensified valorization of capital. But the postulate of the automatis automatism of the labor process innate in capital and its increasing realization merits our attention. In the epoch of manufacture, representing the initial stage of the capitalist mode of production, capital employs the existing artisans of the pre-capitalist period as wage laborers and fits them into a closely knit system of division of labor. Working under extreme pressure of time, a marked increase of labor productivity of each worker is guaranteed, with a correspondingly greater amount of surplus labor to capital. These artisans are transformed from a mass of individual workers doing various jobs in handicraft workshops into an organized collective or compound worker, though still only using hand tools. 
the collective worker who constitutes the living mechanism of manufacture is made up solely of such one-sidedly specialized workers who each performs the same simple operation for the whole of his life and thereby converts his body into the automatic one-sided implement of that operation. But as we have quoted before, since handicraft skill is the foundation of manufacture, and since the mechanism of manufacture as a whole possesses no objective framework, which would be independent of the workers themselves, capital is constantly compelled to wrestle with the insubordination of the workers. In fact, the automat automatism of the labor process upon which capital depends for its control over production is not vested in the human laborer, but in conditions which determine the quantity of his expenditure of the labor power he has sold to the capitalist. The capitalist does not enforce his will by his direct personal action, but only indirectly by the action of things and services which he can buy with his money and watch over with his authority. The answer to the unsolved problem of manufacture was of course the introduction of machinery into the labor process. Of the three parts of the machinery which Marx distinguishes, the motor mechanism, the transmitting mechanism, and the tool or working machine, it is this last part of the machinery with which the Industrial Revolution began. For this part of the machinery replaces the worker who handles a single tool by a mechanism operating with a number of similar tools and set in motion by a single motive power. Indeed, the exposition of Marx in the opening of the 15th chapter is so well known that it might seem redundant to quote further here. However, before arguing my case for distinguishing a third stage of capitalist development, I want to throw into relief the very features of Marx's exposition, which seem to leave no room for such a stage, because he includes in his second stage the most advanced characteristics of the modern labor process including the continuous flow method and the automatic character of present-day production. The collective working machine, which is now an articulated system composed of various kinds of single machine and of groups of single machines, becomes all the more perfect the more the process as a whole becomes a continuous one, i.e. the less the raw material is interrupted in its passage from the first phase to the last. In other words, the more its passage from one phase to another is affected not by the hand of man, but by the machinery itself, as soon as a machine system executes without, many, without man's help all the movements required to elaborate the raw material and needs only supplementary assistance from the worker, we have an automatic system of machinery capable of constant improvement in its, in its details. An organized system of machines to which motion is communicated by the transmitting mechanism from an automatic center is the most developed form of production by machinery. The description given here might stretch to the forms of production of the 20th century right to the present day. To what extent this is the case is shown by the following quotations from Grund Ries. From the moment when fixed capital has developed to a certain extent, and this extent, as we indicated, is the measure of the development of large industry generally. From this instant on, every interruption of the production process acts as a direct reduction of capital itself, of its initial value. Hence, the greater the scale on which fixed capital develops, the more does the continuity of the production process or the constant flow of reproduction become an externally compelling condition for the mode of production founded on capital. And again, hence the continuity of production becomes an external necessity for capital with the development of that portion of it, which is determined as fixed capital. For circulating capital, an interruption is only an interruption in the creation of surplus value. But with fixed capital, the interruption is the destruction of its original value itself. Hence, the continuity of the production process, which corresponds to the concept of capital, is posited as conditio sine qua for its maintenance only with the development of fixed capital. It seems difficult to find room for a third stage of the capitalist mode of production after reading these passages, but what they do not show are the implications carried by the external necessity of the continuity of the production process. These implications cover the evolution of monopoly capitalism, scientific management, and flow production. 
Chapter 23, The Turn to Monopoly Capitalism. In line with Lenin, we consider these developments as distinctive characteristics of a new stage of the capitalist mode of production. Lenin related the change to the level of the organic composition of capital, or the high grade of capital intensity reached in the last quarter of the 19th century. In the heavy industries of iron and steel manufacture, synthetic chemistry and electro industry. This is in fact synonymous with the terminology of Marx and Grundrisse, which Lenin of course did not know. But his theoretical reasoning has been refined and substantiated by certain non-Marxist studies bearing on the same subject. The most pertinent ones are studies in the economics of overhead cost by J.M. Clark and the works by Eugene Schmallenbach, the founder and most important representative of modern management sciences in Germany. The reasoning is simple and incontrovertible. Growing capital intensity and a rising organic composition of capital leads at a certain point to a changing costing structure of production, amounting to an increasing dominance of the so-called indirect or fixed element of the cost. This does not vary with output and still remains constant even when production, as in a severe slump, might have to stop temporarily altogether. These invariable overheads are made up of the interest on loaned capital, depreciation, insurance, maintenance, leases, rents, and so on. Firms wherein this part of the cost is high in relation to the direct costs in the main of materials and wages, which vary according to the volume of output, cannot easily respond to the market regulatives of social economy controlling the play of the law of value. When demand recedes and prices tend to slump, production should be cut down and supplies be diminished, but heavy overheads will cause unit costs to rise with lessened output, and we obtain the contradiction that, adap that adaptation of supplies to receding demands forces the cost to rise when prices fall. In other words, the rising organic composition of capital makes production increasingly inadaptable to the market regulatives. The reaction to this contradiction on the part of the firms affected can only be to force them, as a matter of life and death, to try to obtain control of the movements of the market. This is how they become monopolists. Under the impact of this causality, some of the features of the labor process described by Marx assume a changed significance. Chapter 24. Imperialism and Scientific Management these conditions occurred increasingly in over a spreading range of industry during the last quarter of the 19th century. They assumed spectacular manifestation in the Long Depression following, up, following upon the slump of 1873 to 74, and lasting almost uninterruptedly for more than 20 years. The period remembered as the Hungry 80s was a time of mass unemployment compar comparable to that of the 1930s, a time of hunger marches and mass demonstrations, of strikes and riots and revolutionary class struggle. Socialism for the first time became the catchword of broad political movements resulting in the founding of social mass parties, matched by the organization of the semi-skilled and even the unskilled workers in a new type of trade unionism. The most ominous features of the picture drawn by Marx of the impending expropriation of the expropriators seemed to menace the bourgeois world. Foremost in the picture was the paralyzing decline of the rate of profit, the root cause of all the trouble as predicted by Marx. It was felt most acutely in the industries with the highest organic composition of capital. The heavy iron and steel manufacture, synthetic chemistry and electro industry, the period was particularly prolific in technological and organizational innovations, attempting to overcome the paralyzing overheads, but in fact only aggravating the underlying contradiction so long as the market exercised its un unhampered rule. Several initiatives were undertaken towards regulating production and thereby also prices and profits. As Engels mentions in a well-known footnote in the third volume of Capital, they were effective in producing two hectic booms, each of which, however, collapsed within a year. For until the early 90s, the time of Engels's writing, what he adds was still true. 
that these experiments are bound to break down under the pressure of a new economic downturn. But only a very few years later, his remarks ceased to hold true, and it is correct to state that capitalism entered the long depression of the 1870s in the position of a free market economy and emerged from it in 1895 or 96 in the shape of consolidated monopoly capitalism. Two things were above all imperative for the survival of capitalism at that juncture. The first, an expansion of the markets by opening up new territories and resuming colonial expansion on a new scale, a way recommending itself easiest to the rich European creditor countries like Britain, France, Belgium, and Holland. The second, a substantial increase in the rate of exploitation of the labor employed in the industries at home, a particular need for the United States, still a debtor country, who rapidly advancing in industry and with the world's highest wage level. Oh, okay. In the subsequent course of events, both these remedies in conjunction proved necessary to keep capitalism afloat, especially after the First World War when the USA had turned into the dominant capitalist creditor power. The weakened European countries then followed suit, but with varying time lags and as reluctant modernizers, with one exception, Germany. Through her defeat in territorial retrenchment as well as loss of foreign capital, Germany had been thrown into the anomalous position of a highly industrialized debtor country. This left her little choice but to enhance the exploitation of her own labor force by industrial rationalization on the lines heralded by the American drive for scientific management. To underline the parallelism of the two lines of development by which capitalism wrenched itself out of the paralyzing fetters of the outmoded free market system and onto the open ceiling economics of monopoly capitalism, it suffices to repeat from Lenin's imperialism the conversation he quotes of Cecil Rhodes with the Times correspondent Wickham Steed in 1895. I was in the East End of London yesterday and attended a meeting of the unemployed. I listened to the wild speeches, which were just a cry for bread, bread, bread. And on my way home, I pondered over the scene and I became more than ever convinced of the importance of imperialism. My cherished idea is a solution for the social problem, i.e. in order to save the 40 million inhabitants of the United Kingdom from a bloody civil war, we colonial statesmen must acquire new lands for settling the surplus population to provide new markets for the goods produced in the factories and mines. The empire, as I have always said, is a bread and butter question. If you want to avoid civil war, you must become imperialists. The year 1895 was also that in which Frederick Winslow Taylor introduced his work to the American Society of Mechanical Engineers with a lecture to which he gave the remarkable title, a peace rate system being a step toward a partial solution of the labor problem. Chapter 25, the economy of time and scientific management. The dominance of overhead cost is associated with a specific economy of time relating to the labor process of production. The more highly the production capacity of a given plant is utilized, that is to say, the more products are turned out in a given time and as a consequence, the quicker the capital can be turned over, then the lower is the unit cost of the output and the greater the competitiveness of the enterprise. The speed of operations in utilizing the given plant of a firm is the all important factor in the competitive struggle for profit under conditions of monopoly capitalism. If we look back to the beginnings of the search for modern so-called scientific management, we can see that it was this economy of time which spurred it on. Harry Breverman points to the vital interconnection. It will already have been noticed that the crucial developments in the process of production date from precisely the same period as monopoly capitalism. Scientific management and the whole movement for the organization of production on its modern basis have their beginnings in the last two decades of the last century. And the scientific technical revolution based on the systematic use of science for the more rapid transformation of labor power into capital 
also begins at the same time, both chronologically and functionally. They are part of the new stage of capitalist development and they grow out of monopoly capitalism and make it possible. I would say that they grew out of the root cause which gave rise to monopoly capitalism, the dominance of overhead cost, i.e. the rise in the organic composition of capital and coupled with the speeding of operations with the question of its control. From the lecture by F.W. Taylor already mentioned there, uh, mentioned there ensued a discussion with H.R. Town and F.A. Halsey, his main rivals who had put their premium plan of management before the same society in 1891. The central issue of the debate concerns the question of control. In the Town Halsey plan, the control of the speed problem is turned over to the men, whereas according to Taylor's scheme, it lies with the management. And the main reasoning involved is one of the economics of overhead cost. Indirect expenses equal or exceed the wages paid directly and remain approximately constant whether the output is great or small. Greater output justifies higher wages the diminution of the indirect portion of the cost per piece being greater than the increase in wages. The operating economic factor is the effect that the volume of output has on the unit cost, or as Taylor later, later puts it in his Principles of Scientific Management, it pays the employer to pay higher wages as long as the higher output does not increase overheads. And there is no doubt that Taylor grasped the implications of this economics of time with greater systematic consistency from the standpoint of monopoly capital than anybody else among the would-be founders of the appropriate sort of management at that time. Taylor was the one to whom the claim to be its founder rightfully belongs. Let us go through some of the salient points of his system. Chapter 26. The Essentials of Taylorism. Frederick Winslow Taylor's first writing was the lecture of 1895 given to the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, from which we have already quoted, a piece rate system being a step towards a partial solution of the labor problem. This was the first public intimation of his major work of which the final publication did not appear until 1906, under the title, the title of On the Art of Cutting Metals, a very meticulous book indeed divided into 1,198 paragraphs and supplemented by 24 folders or uh, folders of charts. It has fallen into undeserved oblivion and much better known are the two more popular books, Shop Management and Principles of Scientific Management. The cornerstone of scientific management is the time and motion study of operations. Of this, Taylor says, what the writer wishes particularly to emphasize is that this whole system rests upon the accurate and scientific study of unit times, which is by far the most important element in scientific management. In its original conception, inspired by his undisguised concern for the rate of labor exploitation, Taylorism aroused the opposition and revulsion of the workers to an extent which threatened to defeat its own objectives and therefore it has since been modified and wrapped around with a medley of sciences, physiology, psychology, sociology, and so on. But nothing can conceal the hard core of Taylorism, which is in force today as it ever was, though the technicalities may have altered. His principles are expounded in the following extracts from On the Art of Cutting Metals. In the fall of 1880, the machinists in the small machine shop of the Midvale Steel Company, Philadelphia, most of whom were working on piecework and machining locomotive tires, car axles, and miscellaneous forgings, had combined to do only a certain number of pieces per day on each type of work. The writer, who was the newly appointed foreman of the shop, realized that it was possible for the men to do, in all cases, much more work per day than they were accomplishing. He found, however, that his efforts to get the men to increase their output were blocked by the fact that his knowledge of just what combination of depth of cut, feed, and cutting speed would in each case do the work in the shortest time was much less accurate than that of the machinists, who were combined against him. 
His conviction that the men were not doing half as much as they should do, however, was so strong that he obtained permission of the management to make a series of experiments to investigate the laws of cutting metals with a view to obtaining a knowledge at least equal to that of the combined machinists who were under him. He expected that these experiments would last no longer than six months. Instead of six months, his investigation took him 26 years. A study of the recommendations made throughout this paper will illustrate the fact that we propose to take all the important decisions and planning which vitally affect the output of the shop out of the hands of the workmen and centralize them in a few men, each of whom is especially trained in the art of making those decisions and in seeing that they are carried out, each man having his own particular function in which he is supreme and not interfering with the functions of other men. While his experiments resulted in many valuable discoveries and inventions, e.g. self-hardening steels and new designs of machine tools, we regard as by far the greatest value that portion of our experiments and of our mathematical work, which has resulted in the development of the slide rules, which enable the shop managers, without consulting the workmen, to fix a daily task with a definite time allowance for each workman who is running a machine tool and to pay the men a bonus for rapid work. A slide rule, which serves to make out the effect which each of 12 variables has upon the choice of cutting speed and feed. And again, the gain from these slide rules is far greater than that of all the other improvements combined because it accomplishes the original object for which in 1880 the experiments were started, i.e. that of taking the control of the machine shop out of the hands of the many workmen and placing it completely in the hands of the management, thus superseding the rule of thumb by scientific control. Under our system, the workman is told minutely just what he is to do and how he is to do it, and any improvement which he makes upon the orders given him is fatal to success. Towards the end of his paper, he emphasizes that he did not underestimate the difficulties of, of and resistance to using the slide rules. He would add, however, that he looks upon task management as of such great moment both to the workmen in raising their wages and rendering strikes and labor troubles unnecessary, and to the manufacturers in increasing and cheapening output, that he staked the remainder of his days to further assisting in the putting into practice his conception of management. The crucial advantage and novelty he claimed for his system of management was that it made the rise of profits for the manufacturer compatible with rising wages for the workers. In his own words, high wages and low labor cost are not only compatible, but are in the majority of cases mutually conditional. This is why he saw in it a partial solution of the labor problem. And in 1895, he even expressed the hope that it would contribute to the elimination of the trade circle or tri trade cycle, thus bringing capitalism of its two major evils. Taylor's examples given in shop management show increases in workers' output up to 300% and even 400% relative to a wage increase of 60%. Inflexibility of the cost structure being also the main element making for monopolism, it becomes apparent why Taylorism has its roots in monopoly capitalism. Nor does the causality stop there. Taylor's personal history serves to illustrate how Taylorism itself acts on monopolism. After three or four years' work at the Midvale Steel Company, he transferred his activity to the Bethlehem Steel Company, where he totally reorganized the system of management. Subsequently, the latter forged a merger with the former to found the United Steel Company, the biggest of its kind in the United States. Thus, Taylorism, in its turn, helped to increase the stimulus instigating monopolism. Chapter 27 Critique of Taylorism An explanation is needed for the quotations in the last chapter dealing with Taylor's much advertised slide rules, which hardly reached any practical importance after the introduction of transfer me mechanisms and the flow method of production had rendered them redundant. However, I quote them for a number of reasons. 
in the first place, the immense time and trouble which Taylor devoted to them explain why he spent 26 years on the completion of his main work. Second, they demonstrated Taylor's singleness of purpose in wanting to transfer the whole skill and experience, experience possessed by the craftsmen of metal trades upon the management. This knowledge in the hands of management, management was transformed into an intellectual feat transcribed into a set of norms and rules. It thereby became a possession of the managers to deal with it, to deal with in the interests of capital. They could carve it up, mechanize the subdivisions, and even automate it as a whole. Taylor refers to this knowledge in its original form as all the important decisions and planning which vitally affect the output of the shop. The third reason why I regard Taylor's work on his slide rules of such importance is the clarity with which it shows that such knowledge, if left in the possession of the craftsman, must be linked inseparably with his manual labor, representing his productive capacity as an individual worker. But it also enshrines everything which makes possible the link up of cooperating craftsmen into one collective worker. This socialization of their labor, which should by rights constitute the power of the workers in production, if not even over production, is removed from them by the tailorization of their labor, which instead gives management the means to wield technological coercion upon the workers. In paragraph 116 of On the Art of Cutting Metals, Taylor proclaims, and but little can be accomplished with these laws, derived from the slide rules, unless the old style foremen and shop superintendents have been done away with and functional foremanship has been substituted, consisting of speed bosses, gang bosses, order of workmen, inspectors, time study men, etc. In this type of management created by Taylor are concentrated all the powers needed for ensuring the postulate of automat automatism necessary for the control of capital over production. Monopoly capitalism does indeed represent a third stage of the capitalist mode of production, the one in which it reaches its acme. As early as 1903, in shop management, Taylor stresses that time study in a is a success only if it enables you to know exactly how long the study job should take, and not only how long it does take in any given case. And it goes on to say, um, the best way to do this, in fact, almost the only way in which the timing can be done with certainty is to divide the men's work into its elements and time and time each element separately as unit times. It amounts, of course, to nothing more than a mere pretense to proclaim the arbitrarily fixed time rates for a job in units or no units as norms of independent validity, as if they were extracted miraculously from the bosom of nature or even represented some prescience of the intellect, a prescience, a prescience of the intellect. But this pretense is common practice in all capitalist countries where scientific job analysis is in use. The pretense is inseparable from the whole intention of Taylorism. Under the German Rifa system, for instance, all kinds of manual operations are broken down into six basic elements of motion, and these are again minutely subdivided until the smallest imaginable common particle of these subdivisions is finally allocated a fractional measure of time, counted in hundredths of a second. It is of the essence of Taylorism that the standards of labor timing are not to be mistakes for the empiricism of the work as the workers themselves do it. Taylor does not learn his time measure from the workers. He imparts the knowledge of it as the laws for their work. The whole claim of science for his functional task management hinges upon the accurate and scientific study of time units, the most important element in scientific management. Coercive timing would be an appropriate name to give to this element. It corresponds to the treatment of productive human work in accordance with the logic of appropriation. For if we remind ourselves of the analysis of abstract time and space in part one, it can be seen how the handing over of a coin in payment 
for a commodity separates the time of the act from all its contents. Thereby time is abstractified to a quantifiable dimension into which the scientific intellect can refit carefully selected items of content to make out the mathematics of their laws of behavior in nature cast in commodity form. Precisely this kind of thing happens in Taylorism, but now applying to the absolute antipode to the logic of appropriation, namely to active human labor in its very labor process. Here the intellect acting in the service of the capitalist power of appropriation can assume the mere pretense of its legitimacy in wielding a fictitious norm of labor timing. It is small wonder, therefore, that we can recognize in the work of Taylor and his followers a tendency to progress from empirical timing to synthetic timing. <clears throat> um, I lost my spot. Where the time norm for a job is construed without consulting or watching the worker, even for new jobs which have never been practiced. The first man hired will find himself faced with his technological prerequisites and with the precise time and pay rates for the new job. The proper methods of synthetic timing were evolved, not by Taylor himself, but soon after his death by his pupil Frank Gilbreth. The principle, although it bears the latter's name, was clearly conceived by Taylor and dates back to 1903 at the very latest. Its present um, its present day application in the systems of the measured day rate or the MTM presents therefore no departure from Taylorism, but rather its further fulfillment. <clears throat> in strict keeping with the characteristics of Taylorism is the fact that the concepts of time and motion used in its job analysis are technological categories and no true terms of human labor at all. Taylorized labor, therefore, is human labor made into a technological entity, homogeneous with the machinery, directly adapt adaptable, and can be inserted or transformed into it without any difficulty of conversion. Here, labor is not only subsumed economically to capital, to use Marx's expression, i.e., by the act of the workmen selling their labor power to the capitalist, but also physically and technologically. This is a difference which at first sight may seem of small portent. In actual fact, however, it represents the basis and starting point for the process leading up to the automa automation of human labor in the precise technical sense of the term. To say this does not minimize the importance nor deny the validity of what Marx states of capitalist production in its machine age generally. As we have partly quoted before, every kind of capitalist production, insofar as it is not only a labor process but also capitalist proce process of valorization, has conditions, or sorry, has this in common that it is not the worker who employs the conditions of his work, but rather the reverse, the conditions of work employ the worker. However, it is only with the coming of machinery that this inversion first acquires a technical and palpable reality. Owing to its conversion into an automaton, the instrument of labor confronts the worker during the labor process in the shape of capital, dead labor, which dominates and soaks up living labor power. The separation of the intellectual faculties of the production process from manual labor and the transformation of those faculties into powers exercised by capital over labor is finally completed by large-scale industry erected on the foundation of machinery. The special skill of each individual ma machine operator who has now been deprived of all significance vanishes as an infinitesimal quantity in the face of the science, the gigantic natural forces, and the mass of social labor embodied in the system of machinery, which, together with those three forces, constitute the power of the master. This is indeed a far-sighted anticipation of the development of capitalism, foreshadowing even the stages it fully reached only under monopoly capital. The specificities of the third stage, however, such as the wedding 
together rather than the confrontation of labor and machinery. The conversion of the worker from a machine operator into a part of the machinery, the new forms and further extension of the division of mental and manual labor to the labor process itself. These do not find expression in the above passage of Marx. What it does express, however, is that which both the second and third stages have in common. But the existence of common features does not lessen the immense importance of the, dis of the distinctive characteristics which occur in the mon monopolistic stage. The direct analysis and normative measurement of labor already discussed is one of those characteristics to which we shall return later. The division of head and hand connected with it is equally striking and perhaps of greater implication. In shop management, Taylor states that his system is aimed at establishing a clear-cut and novel division of mental and manual labor throughout the workshops. <clears throat> It is based upon the precise time and motion study of each workman's job in isolation and regulates the entire mental parts of the tasks in hand to the managerial staff, working out minutely detailed job cards which the workmen are left to follow out in the prescribed speed. This latter detail was drastically changed when flow methods came to be introduced somewhat later, causing, however, no mitigation but only further accentuation of the schism made by Taylor between the mind and the body of the industrial workman. The workman has, as it were, handed over his mind to a new institution which has come into existence, the modern management in charge of the economy of time peculiar to monopoly capital. This new division of mental and manual labor must not be confused nor assumed identical with the fundamental one dating from classical antiquity now mainly rooted in the intellectual nature of science, although there are of course links and changes in the practice of science which reinforce these links. But the division directly involved in the managerial authority over the monopolistic labor process is the one between the technical and organizational intelligentsia and the manual workforce. As this division springs from the foundations from which monopoly capitalism itself arises, the stability of monopoly capitalism vitally depends on the relations between these two forces, the mental and manual, remaining safely divided. Should the division be changed into an alliance, the authority of the management should be in jeopardy, or would be in jeopardy. Acting in unison, the direct producers could dispose of the capitalist management and take production into their own control. The cultivation of the specific fetishism of the modern monopolistic management is therefore one of the particular ideological concerns, not only of the capitalists themselves, but of the state. The fetishism has a twofold root. The intellectual tasks vested in this management are not seen as representing the worker's mind, but as deriving directly or indirectly from science and scientific technology. The mysticism of the scientific technical revolution is its mainstay. Above and beyond that, science itself is the principal issue of our autonomous intellect. This assumption about the intellect is made almost unassailable by modern positivism, which places the origins of science outside the range of questions which can be asked. Asking such questions is declared metaphysical and nonsensical. Never has idealism led a more unharassed existence. The second root of the managerial fetishism rests in the individualism of the worker's wage. We have already quoted the important passage from Marx from this chapter, or from his chapter on cooperation, where he shows how the productive power developed by the worker socially appears as a power which capital possesses by its nature, a productive power inherent in capital. This crucial inversion of the productive power of collective labor into the power of capital is magnified in monopoly capitalism, because in the size of the modern system, the workers are more powerless than they have ever been since slavery, owing to the minuteness, minuteness of each individual contribution. However, this aspect of monopoly capital can be fully discussed only on the basis of the all-important sequence to Taylorism. Flow production, which made its very earliest beginnings by Swift in Chicago and Henry Ford in Detroit two years before Taylor's death. As far as I can see, Taylor's writings themselves contain no intimation of his flow methods of production.